Um, let me start by, you know, saying, um, you know, in what sense do we mean testing quantumness? Well, there, there are two, two real senses. Uh, um, I'll tell you about a first one, which is not what I'll, I'll be talking about, but it's, it's very topical. And then, then uh, uh, you know, a second one. So, um, so, um, so, you know, there's one kind of, uh, 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 one aspect of quantumness, which is the so-called entanglement between, between particles. And, uh, you know, what, what, this, what this does is, um, you know, if you have two different, two particles and they are, they are on distant galaxies, but they are entangled, and you, and you measure them, you know, you, you measure the two of them, and neither particle really knows, whatever that means, you know, which measurement the other one is going to be subjected to. So you pick your measurement at random at the last minute, and you do this, you know, as simultaneously as possible. Well then, quantum mechanics sort of tells us that the kind of correlations you get in, your, in, the, in the measurement outcomes are going to be very strange. You know, they, they can be very strange. And they can be so strange that, that, that um, it may seem as though the particles are influencing each other instantly, which of course is not permitted by, uh, you know, uh, by speed of light considerations. And so, um, this property, you know, the, this property of these two uh, particles being sort of um, uh, in some way uh, correlated with each other or in, in this very spooky sort of way, this is, um, uh, you know, this was dubbed entanglement by uh, Erwin Schrodinger. And, uh, oops, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, it was, you know, the, uh, this phenomenon was, was uh, you know, uh, it, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen were the first to put their finger on it in, in this paper on the EPR paradox, also in 1935. Uh, and this was part of Einstein's uh, uh, sort of objection to quantum, quantum physics, you know, as it was formulated. You know, he didn't, he didn't object to quantum mechanics, at, uh, you know, as such, but he, he thought that it was part of a larger theory that remained to be discovered, which would, uh, you know, which would, which would admit of local realism. You know, some something more classical, like you know, where, okay. And, uh, but, but in fact, it uh, it 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 turned out that uh, 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 that um, about thirty years later, John Bell showed that, in fact, quantum mechanics is incompatible with the kinds of, kind of completion of quantum mechanics that, uh, that Einstein wanted, um, you know, this sort of local realism. And that there were actually an experiment you could do to distinguish quantum mechanics from any such kind of local realism theory. So what this meant was that these, you know, that, that was in the sense that these measurements you could do on distant particles which couldn't communicate with each other, right, which gave you these, these uh, strange correlations. Well, you could do that, those experiments and check whether you got certain strange correlations about which Bell showed that you really could not duplicate them, uh, them uh, classically. And in fact, um, uh, last year's Nobel Prize was awarded for exactly you know, this sequence of, of experiments that were done starting, I think, in the early 70s and culminating in experiments that were done just a few years ago, which, uh, uh, which were these so-called loophole-free bell tests, you know, which meant that, you know, as time progressed over the decades, these experiments got refined further and further where you know, for the initial experiment, somebody would say, well, what, you know, but, but you didn't rule out this, the following, and, you know, and by the end of it, the, the kinds of contingencies that were being ruled out were certainly very creative, you know, in the sense of saying, well, what if there was the following conspiracy, but then, okay, so they were all laid to arrest. Okay, so that's one sense in which you could be testing quantumness, okay? I want to talk about a different sense in, in which one might want to test quantumness, okay? And, so this, this different sense in which one wants to might want to test quantumness 
it originates in a paper of Feynman's from, from the early 80s. Um, uh, and the, the, the paper uh, was titled Simulating Physics on a Computer. And by physics, he meant quantum mechanics. And a computer, well, you know, he was, he was talking about, well, how would you simulate it on existing computers, meaning classical computers? And he pointed out that if you try to do it, there's an exponential overhead um, in, you know, that, that it takes you exponential time in the number of particles. So, so what would this mean? So, you know, let's imagine that unlike bits, you know, which, which our computers consist of, we imagine that these particles are just qubits, quantum bits. And they are some, you know, we, have a, we could even think we have a small system of a few hundred such particles, 500 particles. That's still a tiny system. It's microscopic. And you just want to simulate it, meaning, you know, it's what nature is doing. So you, you, you have your in, the initial state, and you want to understand what happens after a certain amount of, a certain period of time. Okay. Well, quantum mechanics tells us what happens after a certain period of time. You know, it's, it's probabilistic. So, so, well, you know, one thing you could, you could demand is that you understand the probability distribution. But that's too much. Nature doesn't do that, right? So all we want to do is do what nature is doing. So, so we want to take this system and evolve it in time, you know, for, for a small amount of, amount of time. So we have the input set up and we want to understand if we were to run this system for you know, for, 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 a, for, a, for a few steps, you know, for, um, for a few minutes or something. And then we measure, right? So we are sampling from the output distribution, just one sample. Right? How long does it take for us to do that? And what Feynman pointed out is that there's a problem. It seems to take exponential time in the number of particles. So why would it take exponential time? Well, that had to do with how the... How, this, how quantum mechanics says you should write down the state of the system, the instantaneous state. So, you know, if these were 500 qubits, well, well, if they were 500 bits, you know, at any given time, they would be in the state either all zeros or 0101 zero, one, zero, one, or 11111, one, 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 you know. How many such states are there? Well, there are two to the 500 of them. But of course, this, the system is in only one of these states at a time and you can write it down. But the quantum system is not in one of these states. It's in a superposition of all of them. And what does it mean, a superposition? Well, you have to take every one of these 500-bit strings, like, like the all zero string or the all one string, and there's a complex number, which is called its amplitude. And so if you want to write out the state of the system, you have to write out all two to the 500 uh, complex numbers. Okay, that's what we have to do when we, when we think of the quantum system. And then, you know, if you want to say, how did the system evolve in time? You've got to sort of keep track of all these two to the 500 numbers and say how they step, stepped in time. And then finally, when you, when you go to measure the out, outcome value, you, you know, you, you actually sample a 500-bit sample a string. So the problem is two to the 500. Exponentials are really, you know, these, these you know, things grow exponentially, that's really, um, it's, it's almost a qualitative difference rather than quantitative, right? So 2 to the 500 in, is larger than estimates on the number of particles in the universe. It's larger than the uh, estimates of the age of the universe in, in femtoseconds. So it's, you know, it's sort of larger than any computation we could not just do, but imagine ever doing in the classical world. And so... So that's the, that's the problem that, that Feynman sort of posed, you know. Uh, and, uh, um, and so there's this, there's this other aspect of quantum mechanics, which is, um, you know, that, that um, the quantum state is the private world of nature, right? As soon as you look, as soon as you look at the system, you disturb it. And you actually end up seeing just a 500-bit string X with probability, well, you, you, you know, these are complex numbers. You take the square, but you have to take the magnitude squared, right? Uh, it doesn't matter that they are complex. You could think of them as, as real numbers, you know, 
but just positive and negative. And so, so now, now if we think about this question, you know, if we have a quantum system in this sense, you know, where, with with some, so so in the in the Bell test we were just thinking about entanglement, and usually we think about two particles. Now there's something else that's happening when you have many particles. It's uh, there's something growing exponentially in 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 the number of particles, and um, how would we test that such a system is quantum? You know, because it might seem from this. Um, you know, this measurement axiom of quantum mechanics, that's, that nature is sort of hiding her tracks. And behind the scenes, you know, this, this entire exponentiality is behind the scenes. And as soon as you look, it just disappears. And, you know, sort of nature pretends it's being, you know, uh, that it's actually quite simple after all, that all you get to see is, is the 500 bits. OK, so. Um, I actually came across uh, Feynman's paper in, in the early 90s. I think it was 91 or 92. Um, a colleague, uh, uh, Leslie Goldschlager, I think, was visiting Berkeley at the time and told me about it. And, and when I heard about it, I was very skeptical. You know, I, I thought, surely, you know, surely either, either my colleague misunderstood Feynman or Feynman was wrong. You know, he just misunderstood computer science. So, you know, the theory of computing. And um, so why, you know, why was I so sure? Well, it's, it's because of something called the extended chair string thesis, which, which forms the foundations of computer science, or formed the foundations of computer science. And what it's, well, let me, let me read the intuitive version of the statement first. So what it says is, you know, if you want to write down a formal model of computers, you, you want to think about any, any kind of computer, you know, re regardless of it, whether it's like your laptop or if, if it's made out of billiard balls, you know, it's all, you can think of many, many kinds of models. And basically this, this thesis says all reasonable computers are functionally equivalent. It, it doesn't matter how you create them. More technically, it says, well, any reasonable model of computation what does reasonable mean? You know, it sh you should be able to, in principle, implement it in, in the real world, right? Not, not, not practically, but in principle, you know, as a thought experiment. So if you come up with any reasonable model of computation, then you can simulate it on the most primitive, boring looking, looking such model. That's called the Turing machine. And, uh, and it won't take you much, much time. You know, so if, if, if it took you some number of steps on, on your, uh, your model, it'll, it'll take not that much longer to do that same computation on the Turing machine, on this very primitive model. Okay. Not very much more means the, the difference in running times grows polynomially, right, rather than exponentially. As we saw, exponential growth is really, you know, it's, it's, it's extreme. Polynomial growth is sort of manageable. So it's sort of saying, well, that, that's what it is. And, you know, where does this come from? So, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, sort of, a, um, you know, an instance of the game of life by Conway, the great mathematician who passed away not, not too long ago. But it sort of, you know, shows that, um, you know, this is something that's, that's as powerful as any computer. You know, it's, you can simulate a Turing machine on it. And basically, what this is showing you is that as soon, as soon as you assume classical physics, you know, which means that you have local differential equations guiding, you know, it's described by local differential equations, which means every part of space sort of minds its own business and, you know, it, it just looks at its local neighborhood to decide what to do next. And you take this kind of a model and you discretize it, and you get a cellular automaton. And then a very, very simple cellular automaton, you know, this one, is as powerful as any computer you could design. And so, so this was the reason that I, you know, I was, I was very skeptical about the paper, but you know, I, went, I went over, looked at the paper, and it's a beautiful paper. You know, Feynman did not misunderstand. He, he had put its finger on something really important. But there was still a problem. 
I did not know quantum mechanics at all. So I decided to drop everything I was doing and start learning it, uh, together with my student, Ethan Bernstein. And uh, you know, because we wanted to see, is, is the extended Cheshire thesis really true? And in fact, you know, we realized that quantum computers violate this extended Cheshire thesis. And so back, back then, we, we sort of realized that, in fact, that this might, this might give us a, a way of testing you know, an, an aspect of quantum mechanics that one might naively think is not testable, you know, which is, you, you might think that this, this, these exponential representations that, that we think you know, that, that quantum mechanics tells us uh, are the right representations for the state of a system behind the scenes. Well, you know, there's a, there's a way we can probe this, the, you know, what's called the Hilbert space. You know, this is the, the exponential dimensional vector that, that describes the state of the system. And the way we, we probe it is by doing some computation that's, that, that would classically be exponentially hard and say, well, you know, but, but nature is doing it for us very quickly. Well, if, it, if, it, if there's not much time for it to do all this, all this computation, there must be a lot of parallelism. There must be a lot of width to it, which is what the Hilbert space is, right? You know, so you, you, can, you can think about it many different ways. You, you know, you can, uh, uh, you, you, can, you can sort of say, well, how is nature doing all this? You know, where does it get the resources to do that? And of course, what, you know, what a physicist would say is, not, well, you know, why are you thinking about that? You know, nature just is. It's doing what it is doing. You know, it's our parochial view that we are thinking, where does it do all this work? But still, you know, you can, you can still sort of, uh, you know, that, that's, that's, that's a very reasonable point of view to take. But still, we are classical beings. So, you know, by our yardstick, nature is doing a lot of work. And so, you know, if, if you're being a, you know, Popperian in your view of science, you, you should be trying to falsify those aspects of, of the theory that are, that are most uh, shocking, right? And so this is what we'd, we'd like to falsify. Yes. really playing dice or yeah. not. I mean, is it that we think because we cannot observe that the nature is playing dice, or is it our hypothesis that is? We don't really know exactly what the story I'll, I'll actually come back to this later. Okay. Um, you know, there's, uh, I, you know there's, there's a more precise way we'll deal with this uh, later in the lecture. So if you hold on for just a little bit. Yeah. But, but that's very good. Uh, you know, that, that's something quite important. Okay, so, so just in the, in the sense of, you know, testing quantum mechanics, you know, quantum mechanics, of course, has been tested to, to exquisite levels of precision, you know, but, um, but you, can, you can argue that it's been tested to these exquisite levels of precision in certain, in certain directions, but there's this direction, there's this new sort of limit that, that we'd like to test quantum mechanics in, which is in this limit of high complexity. You know, where, but by high complexity, I mean not, not a very large number of particles. It could be just a few hundred particles. But already, quantum mechanics is very complex there. Right? So we'd like to test it in that, that regime. And you know, we, there's, there's, the, there's the added, uh, you know, do we expect anything to go wrong? Probably not, right? It's just like the Bell, Bell tests, which were done over all these years and decades. You know, we, we, we think it'll turn out the way, way it is. But uh, if it doesn't, then that'll also be a very interesting, interesting outcome. You know, that's happened before in, in when physics has been tested in various limits of very large velocities or very small sizes, etc. cetera. And, um, it's, it's, it's something interesting. OK, so how would we test um, concretely that, um, you know, uh, this violation of the extended chair string thesis? So here's a, here's a very natural way. So one of the greatest algorithms, quantum algorithms, uh, which gives you an exponential speed up, is Peter Shor's algorithm for factoring and discrete log. So factoring is a particularly easy 
question for, you know, it's, it's what we all know about from grade school, from, from school, high school or something, you know. So what you would do as a test for, for, for quantum NAS is you take your input n and the number you want to factor and input it into the quantum computer. And you measure the output and get the factors. And let, let's say there were two factors, p and q. And the, okay. So what you would do is you take p and q and multiply them together and see if you got n. And that you can do easily on, on your classical computer. And so that would, that would be your test that, in fact, you know, because factoring is really hard. That's the basis of, of the RSA crypto system. Right? We, we think classically it would be, you know, nobody can do that quickly when you have a thousand bit or two thousand bit di digit number, right? So, so um, if, if our device did this, we'd sort of be, be able to say, yes, well, you know, uh, this, is, this is quantum mechanics at work, right? You, you must have this exponential effort space. Unfortunately, uh, th there's a problem, you know, the problem is that for our near-term quantum computers, you know, uh, things that we can look forward to in the next five, ten years, this, this seems like it's too heavy a lift. The overheads are too, too large for that particular algorithm. So the question is, can we do this in the short term? And in fact, there was this, um, this announcement a few years ago uh, that, um, you know, that was, um, you, you may have seen in the newspapers, uh, you know, uh, from Google saying that they had achieved quantum supremacy. Right? Quantum supremacy is another way of saying, saying it's an experimental violation of the extended share sharing thesis. Right? It's, a, it's a demonstration that you got, got an exponential speed up. Okay. And, um, and so let me just uh, you know, try to tell you a little bit about the experiment that they did. And now it's about four years later, so three and a half years later. So I'll also say where things stand with respect to this experiment. Right? So um, what was the experiment? So, so Google designed this 52-qubit processor. And they call it the Sycamore processor. And in this, in this uh, illustration here, the X's are the qubits. These are superconducting qubits. You know, the rectangles are the couplers, which are adjustable. And so what you can do is you can initialize the qubits, say, to all zeros. And then you adjust the coupling, and you, you have one set of interactions among them. Then you adjust the couplings again and do another set of interactions. And you do this several times so that Essentially, you're, you're, you're implementing some sort of a quantum circuit on these qubits, right? And what they did was they did roughly depth 20, you know, uh, they implemented a depth 20 quantum circuit. But, and they had roughly 52 qubits. I think one of them may not have been working, so maybe it was a 51 qubit system. But, but it was roughly that. And now... Well, they were, they were probing a 2 to the 52 dimensional Hilbert space. You know, you need 2 to the 52 complex numbers to hold the state. And, um, you know, they chose this number for, for many reasons. One, this was a major step forward in terms of the experimental reach of, you know, in, in quantum computing. They, you know, uh, it was quite a tour de force, their, their achievement, on, just on experimental grounds, just getting there. Um, but also, you know, they chose this number. It was sort of a Goldilocks uh, principle, right? So n was large enough so that 2 to the n was impressively large. It was small enough so that the kind of uh, computing they had to do classically to verify that this, this experiment, you know, did what it claimed and that it was... Uh, you know, to set up a challenge and say, well, this could not be done classically. This required exponential time classically. Okay, so, so well, 2 to the 52 was a little too much classically, but then they used certain tricks to make it uh, doable on supercomputers. So, okay. So, so this is what they did. So, you know, they, they picked this random quantum circuit C, which is, which is the sort of interactions between qubits you know, these couplers between the qubits uh, for, for 20 levels or so. 
Um, they fixed it once and for all for, for, for many, many trials. And then they initialize the qubits to zero, run the circuit, sample the output. Okay, so the output string would be a 52-bit string X. And then they'd use their supercomputer to compute with what probability would the actual quantum circuit have output X? Okay, so, so, you know, they had a quantum circuit in mind. You can, you can sort of simulate it uh, on your classical computer and figure out what probability should X have been output with. And then they, they just repeated the process millions of times with that same circuit and collected samples. And later they wanted to do some statistical test to say, did this output really come out of that, that quantum circuit? Was, was, was that quantum circuit really responsible for these outputs? Okay. So here's a cartoon depiction of the experiment. You know, there's your input, those are your qubits. The quantum circuit, how is it controlled? You know, these classical couplers are being controlled, but that's being done very fast by a, by a classical computer which controls the couplers. When you measure the classical out, you know, measure the output, you get 52 bits. You repeat many times, collect many random samples. And then what you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to see, check whether, whether this, this device is speaking with a quantum accent. So how do you check it's a quantum accent? Well, you run some statistical test, which is actually called linear cross entropy benchmarking. And so you perform that statistical test and you see how well it does. Okay, so, so if you look at that statistical test, how it, here's how, you know, there's a number that pops out as a result of that statistical test. If the output is uniformly random, you know, just coin flips, then the output is going to be zero. If the output was really drawn from that quantum circuit, you know, samples from the output of that quantum circuit, then this particular statistical measure would be one. What was Google's score on this? It was 0 0.002, okay? And so then, the, then they said, well, see, this shows it's quantum. <laughs> okay, so what gave them the right to do that, you know? What, what gave them the right to say there couldn't be any way of classically spoofing this? Okay. So, so you can have different standards for classical spoofing, right? Uh, one thing you can, you know, so uh, first of all, why was it 0 0.002? Well, because, because the quantum computer is very noisy, the, you know, that, that they had implemented. You know, each gate had fidelity 99.2, 99 99.3%, 99 some, something like that. But that still meant it made an error one, you know, roughly one in 300 times, and that's, that adds up. Okay, and so, um, so what you might worry about is, well, how do we know that behind the scenes, you know, this, this whole thing didn't become classical in some way and that there's, there's really a classical algorithm? Or you could be even more conspiratorial and you could say, well, how do we know there isn't some clever classical algorithm which will, which will spoof this? Not necessarily something that this, you know, whatever equipment that they have is really, you know, deforming into under noise, right? Okay. So there was, there was a very, uh, you know, probably the, there, were, there were quite a few pieces of evidence, but this was, the, this was the best evidence we had in favor of Google's experiment. Um, you know, and it's, it's based on a very simple principle. It says, when you're sample, sampling from a probability distribution, the strings you will, you know, the outputs you will tend to see, the samples you will tend to see, are the ones which are heavy. Heavy meaning they have higher probability, right? The lower probability uh, sam samples from the distribution, they are going to be rare, right? And so what, what Aronson Chen and Aronson Gunn did is, um, is they, they put forward this, this, uh, this hypothesis that there's no classical algorithm that can guess with even a tiny you know, so, you know, okay, so if you want to guess whether a given, given output X, a given sample X, has, has greater than median probability or less than median probability, well, since the median is right in the middle, you know, 
If you didn't know anything, you'd guess 50-50 above or below the median. But now you want to, you want to know, you know you, I give you a sample and I ask you, according to this quantum circuit that we fixed, would this have, you know, even slightly, you know, would it have higher than median or lower than median probability? And the claim is, if you're, if you're going to spend a reasonable amount of time, you know, polynomial time, then you cannot guess with probability even slightly above a half. Right? Half plus exponentially small in, in n. Right? And once you assume this hypothesis, you'd have to conclude that even a small positive score on the Google experiment should be convincing, that it cannot be classically spoofed. Okay, okay so here's, here's another way to think about this, this hypothesis. You see, when you think about a, a, a quantum circuit, right, a comp quantum computation, you know, well, we start with the definite input all zeros, but then over time, we go into a superposition of, of different, different strings. And one way you can think about it is, you know, when you, when you apply a quantum gate to, you know, so if we start from the all zero string and we apply a quantum gate to the first, first qubit, what will happen is, with some amplitude, it'll, it'll stay zero. With some amplitude, it'll become one. So meaning our n-bit string will go from all zeros to being some superposition of all zeros or one zero 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 zero. And that'll happen with every, every gate will sort of branch out into those qubits either being zero or one. Okay. And so there's something called the Feynman path integral approach, which sort of says, Look, one way you can figure out what happens at the end of this, you know, end of any physical process is you just follow it out and you say, every time there's a branching point, you just look at all possible, you know, you look at every possible branch, right? So, so there's, you know, you can, you can start with all zeros and you, you say, there's a, there's, a, there's a path through this computation where at every step you have a, you have a classical string. But now there'll be an amplitude with which you take that path. And you add up these amplitudes over all possible paths, and there are exponentially many. And then you would, you would, you would add up all those amplitudes at the end, and that'll give you, the, the, you know, what the computation looks like. OK. So the problem with the Feynman path approach is that all of the exponentially many Feynman paths look similar. So if you, if, you only, if you don't have exponential time, then you're going to only sample a few of them. And if you sample only a few of them, you cannot get more than an exponentially small advantage. So that, that's where this hypothesis comes from. It seemed very reasonable, and so you know, it gave us some confidence in that, that this was, this was uh, true. So what happened since is that there are these two papers from, uh, from the last two years which, which call into question this, this hypothesis. And they also show that there is actually an efficient classical algorithm to sample, you know, to, sample, to, to, to create, produce samples from the output of this, of a random quantum circuit like Google picked, as long as it's noisy enough. Okay. And this is, this is based on actually a, not the Feynman path integral, but a Pauli path integral. Or, well, it's, you know, that got defined sort of in, in, uh, in the course of all these, all these uh, you know, all these works. But basically, what you do is, instead of looking at, at, at n-bit strings, you look at something else. You know, it's, uh, it's a different basis, you know, um, identity x, y, z, except identity, you know, which is, which is, a, which is the identity matrix, a two by two identity matrix. It's special. It, you know, it's different from zero. Zero and one are symmetrical. You know, in bits. You know, what do you care which one it is? But identity is, is special, and so these these paths that you follow. You know, they, you know how they are special if they have low weight. If 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 there are very few identities, uh, if there are very few x y z's in it, and now it turns out that uh, you can sample only a few paths and still still get a pretty good estimate, and so. That's that's what that's what changed. Okay, so so uh, so where does this leave us? 
Well, they don't completely rule out random circuit sampling, you know, this kind of experiment that, that, uh, that Google did as a path towards an experimental violation of the extended chair string thesis. But, but definitely it makes it much, much more, you know, it, it makes it much more difficult, both as a theoretical thing and, you know, it's, it's sort of, uh, it's not clear whether this is going to be the best path. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about a different, uh, a different uh, genre of work that, uh, that has a few advantages. So one of the advantages is, so in, in, the, in this, uh, in this uh, approach that I, that I spoke about, you know, you had to choose these Goldilocks uh, trade-offs, you know, so because, the, because verifying classically that the right thing happened took exponential time, and that, that we cannot afford to do except for small enough values. So now we'll get efficient verification, right? So we can scale this up to much larger n. We'll get provable security, okay, under some very standard assumptions in cryptography, much more functionality, and then the major question is, how practical is it? So that's, that's, where, we, that's where we are. So these are so-called cryptographic proofs of quantumness. So what do cryptographic proofs look like? So, so here's, our, here's our scenario. We are, we are thinking of, you know, we have a black box, which is this quantum device. We, we don't really trust it. We, we hope for the best. We think it's a quantum computer. We think we know how it works. But we are going to be... Uh, somewhat skeptical, right? So, uh, and, and we can interact with it. So we can send it messages and it can send us back messages. We don't want to interact with it too much because, you know, it's costly. And, and now there's, there's something, you know, there's something about this interaction with it which is a little unfair, right? It's, it's a little unfair to the guy on the left side, right? Because, because you know, this, if this black box is working as it should, then it's extremely powerful. Right? It can do computations that we, on, we, we can only dream about. It's also very secretive, right? because any time you look at it, it sort of pretends, no, you know, it's just not doing very much. You know. So what we are going to do is we are going to use cryptography to level the playing field. Okay, so what kind of cryptography? Well, it turns out you know, once we have quantum computers, cryptography is not dead. You know, the RSC system, the crypto system will be, will be cracked. But there are new kinds of crypto systems which, which are, you know, which even quantum computers, we believe, won't be able to break. So we can use that kind of crypto cryptography, right? Now, but, but, you know, when we use this kind of cryptography, we have to be a little bit careful because we could use that kind of cryptography and say, look, um, you know, it's like a public key crypto system where, uh, where we know the secret key, so we can decrypt me messages, uh, anybody can encrypt them, just like with RSA, except, except that unlike RSA, even a quantum computer cannot decrypt the message without, without knowing the secret key. So in other words, we have some capability that the quantum computer does not, right? So the, the, you know, the, there's, there's sort of a not very constructive way to use that, you know, where we could sort of say, look, here, yeah, we can do something that you can't, you know, sort of you, 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 you hobble the quantum computer and you say, well, we can do something you can't. So the interesting way to do it is, is to allow the quantum computer to do all the things that it can do, right? All its, all its interesting quantum powers, but use the cryptography to check that it's doing what we think it is, what, what we thought it was, right? That would, that would give us a proof of quantumness. So that would be a symbiotic relationship where we can do something it can't, it can do many things we can't, and we'll, we'll sort of try to interact with it, okay? So, so here's how it works, you know, here's a rough outline of this protocol. So we send some, some message across, we call that F, the quantum computer based on F now commits to some n-bit string, you know, Y. Then we send back a challenge to the quantum computer, zero or one, and it gives us the answer to that challenge, X or D, okay? 
Now, there's something curious that happens here. So the curious thing that happens is that we'll set this protocol up in such a way that the quantum computer can answer either challenge, always, perfectly. So, so we go through the protocol, you know, we send it the initial message, obviously it can send us why, it's just a commitment to something. Then we send the real challenge, zero or one, no matter which one we pick, the quantum computer can answer either one. Okay, okay and, uh, and the classical verifier has a secret key, uh, you know, to the cryptography and can verify that, the, that these answers are really the correct answers. Okay, so that's, that's going to be easy for it to do. The, the interesting thing is, what we, the way we'll show that, the, that a classical computer will not succeed in, doing, in, in answering these challenges, either challenge, is by showing that, in fact, a classical computer cannot, cannot answer both challenges, zero and one. Okay. But then we, are, we come up against a problem, which is neither can a quantum computer. A quantum computer also cannot answer both challenges, both zero and one. Okay. But the point is that, that when we ask for the challenge, when we, when we send the challenge zero or one, and the quantum computer answers it, you know, that's like a measurement. You know, it, it sends us back a classical string. That's like a measurement of the state. Now the state is gone. We, 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 we can no longer use it. So, if we now change our mind and say, no, no, you know, I didn't want to ask the, the challenge zero, I wanted to ask the challenge one, the quantum computer can say, well, it's too late, sorry, I, you know, I just, you know, I don't have that state anymore, I can't give you the answer. What about a classical computer? You know, you give it the challenge zero, it sends you the answer, then you say, you know, I, sorry, I, I, wanted, I wanted you to ask, you know, answer the challenge one. Well, it's a classical computer. Right? You can just keep around the state of it at every step. It's, it's just a classical state. We can store the state. You can back it up. Right? So what we would do is keep the state of this, of this entire computer. We download it somewhere right after it committed the string Y. And then we ask it the challenge zero. It gives us back the answer. Then we restore the state of the computer from the backup. Right? And now ask it challenge one. And it's got to answer that. If it's, if it's going to succeed in either, it's got to succeed in both. But we know neither classical nor quantum can succeed in both. Well, quantum can slide around that and answer one, but, but the classical computer can't. Yeah. I'm a bit confused. Can you clarify? Uh, in this cryptographic proof, who is doing the encryption? Who is doing the decryption? And at what point yeah. what is the meaning of the commitment to why? How okay. is why being computed? Okay, so let me, maybe I can, I can give you a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, I, I can't answer, explain the whole thing because it's, it takes a little bit of time to understand all that, but I'll give you just a hint of it in the next slide. Okay, so here's, here's how it looks in terms of the encryption. So... So in the course of this, of this interaction, what the quantum computer ends up preparing is a single quantum bit in a superposition of zero and one. Okay, and it's either, you know, the one over square root two is just a normalizing factor, but it's either in the state zero plus one or zero minus one. You know, so there's a phase of either plus one or minus one on that, on the, on the, on the qubit uh, when it's in the state one. Which of those two is it? Well, depends upon this bit B. Okay. But the, the quantum computer will not know the encrypt, will only know the encryption of this bit B under, under that crypto system. It doesn't know what the bit B is. Okay. But it can send that encryption, encrypted value to, the, to this classical verifier. And the classical verifier has the secret key, so the classical verifier can figure out what B is efficiently. That's, that's the... Okay. okay, so now if we, if we set this up, we can actually use it, coming back to your question about 
um, does nature rule, you know, play dice. What you can do is, you know, so what, what we've managed to do is we've managed to get this black box to commit, you know, to actually create this, this superposition of zero and one. And we, you know, we, we are going to be pretty sure that that's the state it has, right? So now that we are sure it's, it has that state, we can just ask it to measure that state. And that will give us random bits. So we are in this peculiar position where we have a device that we don't trust at all. We are just going to interrogate it. And based on that interrogation, we are going to get output bits, which, where we can say, not that generally this, this, this device produces randomness, which even, even that classically would be very hard to do. But here we'd be, we'd be saying, we have certified that this particular string is random, which is an extraordinary thing to, to be able to say, which we couldn't possibly do in a, in a classical universe. So you know, that's, that's the sense in which we can do something interesting with it. OK, so there's a, there's a challenge right now to implement these kinds of proofs of quantumness for the next generation of quantum processors. And for the next generation of quantum processors, uh, you know, ver in various technologies, people are sort of aiming for in the next few years, maybe two or three, four years, to get to thousands of qubits and maybe somewhere between three nines and four nines of fidelity. And, and so we've currently been trying to work through these, and we, you know, we think we have ways of implementing these which just about make it within, this, within this, uh, these, these specs. And so you know, that would give, you know, once, once we check it through sufficiently, that would be one potential challenge for these, these next generation of devices. There's, you know, once you have this machinery built up, there's a lot more you can do with it. There's something called quantum fully homomorphic encryption, where you, know, you have your quantum computer in the cloud, you don't want to trust your data to it, but, but you want it to compute for you, but under some encryption, you can do that. You can verify an arbitrary quantum comp computation. These are beautiful results uh, in the field. I, I just want to wrap up with one, one last thing. Uh, so, so the one last thing is, well, now the, you know, once we sort of establish, well, the quantum, the extended charge string thesis maybe, you know, gets violated, even experimentally, where, where do we go to next? So the next thing we, we could say is, well, maybe, maybe we should be thinking now about the quantum extended charge string thesis, right? What can we compute? Well, the only things we can compute are those which you can compute efficiently on a quantum computer. And so people have tested this out and various other, you know, can you, does this get broken by uh, field theory or top topological, you know, qu quantum field theory? And it, it all seems to check out, you know, as far as we know, what everything you can do in the physical world can be done using quantum computers. Except there's this one place where there seems to be a question mark. So there's this you know, very basic question of reconciling, reconciling general relativity and quantum mechanics, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard question. So, um, you know, about 25 years ago, uh, Juan Maldesina sort of proposed that, you know, there's, there's a way in which you can view gravity and quantum mechanics as two dual views of the same reality. And uh, recently, there are, there are some indications that this two views of the same reality, you know, some, some indications from, again, cryptographic considerations, which is really very uh, interesting, you know, that that comes into it, but showing that the mapping between these two, two views might, might itself be exponentially difficult. And so, you know, in some sense, we, you know, there's, there's a possibility we are back to the situation we were about 30 years ago when we were wondering, well, is the extended shear string thesis violated? So we could sort of ask, well, if there's a way that we can, we can view the world from both of these points of view, right? maybe we could do something like gravity sampling. And, you know, 
So back, back, in, back in those days, 30 years ago, we were not thinking, you know, we were sort of saying, well, who knows, you know, maybe, maybe this can be implemented, maybe this can't. But, uh, but certainly it's interesting to think about. And certainly it, it has a bearing on the, it, it must have a bearing on the foundations of both computer science and physics. And so maybe we are back to the same, same kind of situation here, thinking about the quantum extended sharing pieces. Okay, thank you for your attention. Time for questions. For testing quantumness, I'm trying to understand, is this the right way to think about it, say you have a number of qubits? The way I am understanding is that the, whether the um, entanglement has not broken down or the, or the joint distributions have not collapsed, that's the way to understand whether there is quantumness in there? Yeah, so uh, may, maybe, uh, you know, okay, so, uh, you know, maybe an another way to, uh, m let me reformulate your question just a little bit, you know, uh, or at least I'll, I'll say it in a slightly different way. So maybe, uh, you know, I sort of, in some sense, calling it testing quantumness is maybe an overreach because it's testing quantumness in what sense? Right, so, so the Bell experiments were testing quantumness in a certain way, you know, whether there's entanglement within, between these two particles. Uh, what, what I was interested in was a particular notion of what it means to be quantum, which, which I find very surprising, which is, which is this exponentiality, you know, the, the expen exponential dimension of the Hilbert space, the fact that, you know, and then, and then the fact that it supports an exponential amount of computation even through this tiny window through which we get to see the quantum state, right? We don't actually get to see the quantum state, we just get, get, to, get to get this faintest of glimpses into it through, this, through a measurement. And then the question is, through that, ti you know, that, that tiny window, can you actually test that there was this exponential object behind, the, behind that window? That's what I meant by testing quantumness. Yes. If you had a thousand qubits and you did your experiment and you got to, let's say, one nine ninety percent, uh, could you prove that through error correction you could come as close as you want to one? Yeah, four so, nines or five nines? Uh, yes. So uh, you know that's that's the that's the other goal of these you know, of the next generation is to try to get a single error corrected qubit, which does better than, than the qubit. You know, so initially the goal is to get a, get a better qubit than you, or, or get better gates than you put into the mix, right? But, but if, you want to, if you want to implement many qubits that are, you know, that are now better, it's going to take not this next generation, but probably the one after that or the one after that. So. But you're, you're satisfied that if you had the, the better qubit, then you would have the better results. So there is. That, that's what we think. Awesomeness. That's what we think. We, you know, I, I think we have to examine it much more carefully. Um, uh, probably, you know, uh, e even if we are convinced now, I think we'll continue to be skeptical and examine it for the next two, three years until the experimentalists get their, get their results. Uh, I, uh, you know, I think this is, um, you know, uh, it's a little bit by, like the Bell experiments, right? We have to do them, make them better and better, and so on, so, yes. Um, so you kind of tease about classical and quantum systems cooperating. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Oh, I see. Um, in in this in this context, yeah. So, um, um, so you know, to to set up this protocol, um, we we had to use certain properties. You know, we had to use we couldn't use any old crypto systems, right? We had to use certain uh, cert a certain kind of cryptography where we had, um, uh, you, you know where we had what's called a, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, trapdoor claw free function, you know, where where you where where they end up being. Um, if you if you have an encrypted value, there are two ways of decrypting it, and uh, and the the way you cooperate with the with the quantum computer is, you know, it ends up encrypting a superposition of those two values, and it measure you know it 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 encrypts a superposition of all the values. Uh, Okay, and now it has a superposition on the encrypted values as well, but then it measures it and sends that to you. That's why that it's sending back. But now, once it measures it, the inputs collapse as well, and they are exactly these two inputs that, that, that collided to give you that output. But it has no idea what those two are. But since, since classically we are holding on to the decryption key and it told us what the encrypted value is, we, can, we know what the two values are. So now we are in this, in this interesting place where it has the superposition, it's able to manipulate the superposition, but it has no idea what the superposition looks like. Right? And so now we want to leverage this and lead it around by, by saying, well, do this to it and do that to it, but it has no idea what it's doing. You know, it has a capability of doing all those things, but it doesn't know what it's applying it to. Whereas, whereas we, we know what it's applying it to because, you know, because we figured that out. And now we can we can sort of steer it around. Okay. That's that's the that's the symbiotic relationship. Um, in the Google experiments, you quoted a number of points for all two. Um, is, is it reasonable to ask what the error bars on that number might be? No, I see. Um, um, it is reasonable to ask. It's an utterly reasonable thing. I, I, I confess I don't, don't know. I think that they, okay, so here, maybe, maybe I can give you my understanding of it. My understanding is that, you know, if you, um, you know, you can, you can come up with a model of what's going on and you sort of say, well, uh, okay, so, uh, so, you know, you have 50 qubits, depth, depth 20, right? Uh, so um, that's, that's, uh, um, that's a thousand gates, right? Um, um, let's say you have you have a, a one percent chance of error. So, so the chance that you did not get an error in these thousand gates, you know, well, in a, the the chance that you did not get a, an error in a hundred gates would be roughly one over e, right? So if you have if you have the number of gates is equal to the is, is equal to one over the error, then you get one over e as your chance of chance of error. Almost, you know, pretty close to one over e. But now you have a factor of 10 more gates. So your chance of, of seeing no error would be one over e to the 10, right? Which is, let's say, one over two to the 10, which is roughly one in a thousand. Sorry, one in uh, two to the 10 is, uh, is a, yeah, so it's a, it's a thousand, right? So, so now you're saying, well, there's a one in, one in a thousand chance that there was no error during this entire run. But then you also say, well, look, if there was an error, then it would really scramble up the output and give you something that, to this statistical measure, looks pretty uniform. Okay. And so your signal is now one in a thousand. And so if you, if you do roughly a million trials, you're pretty safe. You know? so, so you're getting this, you know, the, the point zero zero two one in a thousand, Thousand is coming from uh, from that calculation, but now you you know now you do enough runs that you're one in a thousand. You know that that's not too much, right? To to do so that's that's roughly the the thinking behind it. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I was particularly intrigued by the way you described like approving a quantum computer as like classical input, also uh, viewing it as like a Turing machine that basically you have a bunch of bits, instruction, and data. Now to bring it to your last slide, the ADS CFD, that sounds like very similar. So we have the ADS side and then we have the CFD side. Does that have any implications in terms of what Hamiltonians we can cook up on the CFD side? So because I guess the disconnect that I see or the part that I'm somewhat murky on is, in the quantum computer, 
ideally we're able to apply any Hamiltonian we want. Yeah. But on the ADSCFD, it seems very analog analogous to what you described, except I'm not sure how exactly we're because like we are talking about yeah, no, these, right, these right? are these are somewhat well, at least for me, these are very deep waters, and I'm really still trying to figure out how to how to navigate them. You know, so we we feel we sort of. Uh, it's almost like we have a tiger by the tail. We, we don't have much, you know, we understand the crypt crypto cryptographic aspects of it. I don't really understand those aspects very well. So, you know, so, uh, but we are trying to, you know, it's, it's one, you know, that's one of the nice things about this kind of work because, um, you know, um, you know, you end up knowing one aspect of it, but not the other one. There are other people who know the other aspect, but not, not yours. And you, you sort of try to tease it out together. There's a, Back here. Uh, uh, last year, there was an article that appeared on Nature magazine regarding like simulating wormholes using a quantum computer, mm -hmm. which was heavily critiqued. Yes. Um, so I guess like someone who works in the quantum computing field, how would you suggest someone filter out experiments that doesn't necessarily push forward? But rather just emphasize, emphasize the use of a Yeah, so, well, in the, in the case of that particular experiment, there was there's something on the archive from a week or two ago, which actually outlines in what sense, um, you know, what, what the precise criticism was. And I think that's actually, uh, well, okay, so I can't say that I've read that paper. I had the author describe it to me, and it was really extremely cogent and very easy to understand. So... I'm assuming the paper itself is equally cogent and easy to understand. So, you know, I, I think that, uh, that the good thing here is that, that, um, that there are scientists who are looking at it from, you know, th that um, people are not trying to sort of, uh, you know, fool each other here. They're, you know, they're really honestly trying. And, and when, there's a, when there's an issue, you, you'll probably see it soon that there's a people who correct it or point it out. And it's, it's a more cooperative venture. We're going to take one last question, please. I have a somewhat maybe technical question <laughs> on these results that this x quad conjecture is basically wrong, uh, meaning the, the kind of proof that you guys have that, that if there is noise in the system, you can do random circuit sampling with polynomial effort on a classical machine. What is the main bottleneck that prevents you from proving that every MISC machine can be simulated in yeah. polynomial time? Yeah. Um, so, so by the way, those those two results are different. You yeah, know, yeah, the yeah. x quad versus the uh, you know the the sampling sure. with noise, and you know to to be very uh, precise, you know. It's, it's that particular formulation of x quad that, that breaks. You, know, right. you could change the parameters, and we don't know. But also, equally well, uh, you know, we don't know how to attack it, but also then we don't know how to, with those different parameters, we don't know how to show that the, that the, that the protocol itself is, cannot be uh, classically spoofed. So this, the choice of parameters was important important as far as we know. So it, it's all a bit open right now. Right. But in terms of the classical simulation of, of uh, noisy right. you know, quantum circuits, for, for that, it's pretty important that it was a, it was a random circuit. And we can, we can ease the assumptions about randomness quite a bit, but eventually we do need some kind of randomness there. So you know, there are other circuits which we could make up, uh, which might even be interesting, which we cannot say that about. Because they do some autonomous error correction, or, or what's the reason? Uh, no, so so you know when we when we do this Pauli path, you know, the, so so what we are doing is trunky, You know, if you think of this Pauli Pauli uh, um, expansion, you could think of it as a Fourier expansion, and then we are truncating it. Right. But to 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 get control over the errors, we really do need some randomness to get some orthogonality properties. And if you don't have those, we can't bound the errors. So, so that, that, that ends up being, uh, being the issue.